I, I got just a message uh, from a follower on Facebook the other day, and he said, you should talk to this guy following this controversy. And honestly, I can't bring myself to mention their stupid names of these two social media influencers. Well, how influential can you be if no one knows who you are? No one notices you're missing. Uh, two rich kids from Auckland, fundamentally, who were getting their jollies, kumbayaing around the world and throwing uh, sh- throwing pictures up on, I, I don't know, Insta or TikTok or something that made other people think they were jerks. Anyway, um, the government, and, and things are not good in the country of Iran right now, there appears to be a, or a putative populist uprising against a very authoritarian religiously based regime that is, is particularly harsh on civil liberties, civil freedoms and the rights of women. And it has been that way for some time. This is the country that inspired or ordered the fatwa, I think it's called, against Salman Rushdie, who has lost the sight in one eye as a result of an attack on him by an extremist inspired by the instructions of the religious elite of Iran. Um, These two social media influencers were taken into custody by the Iranians. Um, A news blackout was organised by the government and leading news media companies. And they were eventually released, or at least last week, one presumes after some sort of consideration was given or some money was paid. And it was clear that our muted response in terms of foreign affairs to the uh, situation in Iran was in part influenced by the stupidity of these two people in being uh, captured by the Iranian authorities. Um, I note today, too, that Jacinda Ardern is to unveil fresh measures against Iran as protests in the country intensify. It's uh, the government, the New Zealand government, has suspended its human rights dialogue with Iran. Um... And after Cabinet yesterday, which I couldn't get to, the Prime Minister said there are going to be new measures against Iran. So perhaps we have a freer hand now that those two bozos are out of Iran. Um, And no doubt they'll be giving interviews on rock radio stations about what happened. Uh, But in the wake of all that, I thought, what an unusual situation for any Kiwi to be in. And I got this contact through um, a Facebook follower. He said, you should talk to this guy. He's done 40 days in an Iranian prison and he had to pay his way out. So um, we contacted him yesterday and he joins us. He joins us by video link, actually. Now his name is uh, Rob McGregor. He's a New Zealand uh, businessman. Rob, welcome to the platform. It's lovely to have you with us and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, Rob, tell us... um, and this was a couple of de- days ago. Tell us about you and Iran. What's your business relationship, your personal relationship with that country? All oh, right. Well, back in, in – I lived in Auckland back then. I'm in Napier now. But I was in the coffee roasting industry back then. And in 2016, I got invited to do some seminars in Iran to speak about um, – sustainable coffee techniques, cupping techniques for buying green beans and things like that because that was part of my job in Auckland. And I was dubious. Uh, I'd heard lots of bad about Iran. That's what we tend to hear. And uh, the lady that used to cut my hair was an Iranian lady on, on the north shore of Auckland. And when I asked her and said, should I go, she said, go, whatever you do, Iran's a beautiful country, beautiful people, it's safe as anything, and I thought, I'll do it. So in 2016, I went and I did some seminars over there, and I saw an, an Iran that was different to what I'd read on media. I had seen Anthony Bourdain, who's now passed, He's, he was a celebra- celebrity chef, and Um, If you ever want to see a side of Iran that shows how amazing the hospitality, the food, the people are, you can watch that on YouTube. So I went there and I gave the seminars and at the end of my time there, a couple of weeks, I met a couple of guys and they proposed that if I could help them set a coffee roasting business up there. So that's how it started. Cool. Okay. So your initial contact involvement with the country of Iran was pleasant and, I guess, fruitful in terms of, of being a business person. When did that change and how did you get into trouble? 
<laughs> well, so from 2016 onwards, um, my, my wife back then and I, we decided to invest in Iran and get a whole lot of equipment to set up a coffee roasting company. Back then under the Obama administration, there wasn't such strict sanctions that Trump put in later on. And um, they were looking for investors to come in there and do it. So we decided to put quite a few hundred thousand dollars in, buy big machines. We bought, invested into a building over there. And I went in and out of Iran multiple times from um, 2016 to 2018. And then in 2018, I, um, I decided to go and live in Iran full time. So I left New Zealand. I had an apartment that I was sharing with my business partner. We had established the coffee roasting company. It was growing fast. And I was enjoying my time uh, traveling mm. around Iran to cities like Isfahan, like a, a very historical old city, Shiraz, Rasht, Tabriz, and all around Tehran. I was based in Tehran. And the, from, you know, contrary to what we get told that it's a dangerous place and you should never travel there, actually, I've been to 41 countries. Out of all the places I've been to, Iran was the safest country to, to do tourism. Never once was I threatened. Never once was I overcharged, not by a taxi driver. When you go into any shop or market and you, there's a price or no price, the price that you're given is the price. You don't have to haggle or barter. Right, okay, that's and unusual for that part of the world. It is. They're yeah. very genuine, caring people. And, I mean, a woman can walk, a foreigner can walk late at night and most areas of Iran and never get hassled. They don't get wolf whistled. They don't get hit on. People generally care about their welfare. Mm. And so... We started the business and I was traveling a lot with around Iran, doing holding seminars, visiting mm. trade shows, growing the business and um, enjoying myself. The food is amazing. Yep. The just Yeah, the, we've the got that. Year. So where did it go wrong? What happened in what, 2020, 2019? Okay, so I had, I, I had to take money into Iran because of international sanctions. You can't send yep. money internationally. And so when I'd come back to New Zealand every six months, I'd go back to Iran with 20,000 euros, 50,000 euros, because everything you had to purchase had to be with cash. I was always good getting into the country with cash, but the problem arised in 2020 when, when um, <clears throat> lockdowns happened and I wanted to come back to New Zealand. I wanted to take my money out. I had taken money out before. I had a large amount of cash on me. I had COVID, I was sick, I was coming back and they arrested me at the airport and charged me with currency smuggling. Okay. And, yeah. And was it a friendly, lovely, open place then when you get arrested at the airport and charged with currency smuggling? What happened then? Well, no, it's you, you're just treated like a criminal immediately. They, they, that you are guilty until proven more guilty in Iran. <laughs> it, it is just a tough place to break the law, mm. and and yes, I broke the law unintentionally. It was out of the you know I had no malintention. I wasn't a currency smuggler. Um, I was put in a cell. They confiscated my money, and then the next day I was sent before a judge, and he said you have to go and face a, 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 a trial long term to see if you're proven guilty, gather all the information. I was sent to Evan Prison, which you have just heard a lot about in the media lately. And I was, the, the first two weeks was just sheer hell in there. Um, it's You are psychologically analysed for two weeks to see whether you're a mental case, whether you're violent, whether you have a drug addiction, whatever, and then they put you into a more permanent ward. And and there was just brawls every night, massive ones involving... What were the, the fundamental place. conditions like in terms of cleanliness? Did you have access to running water? What were you dressed in? What were you fed? Our clothes were taken off and we were given prison clothes. We were fed rice and lentils most days with the tiniest bit of meat. There was running water, but it was in generally in the toilet block. So everything you had to do, fill your bottles up, was in the toilet block. 
where everything else was done. Uh-huh. So not ideal, nothing like New Zealand. The cells were, my cell had 12 men in it and it was half the size of most people's living rooms. It was us. Uh, seven meters by four meters and bunks of three people up the bunks and 12 people. Wow. Rough, really. Okay. Were you physically safe? Were the other people you were in prison with gentle souls? No. Some were, but there was a lot of violent guys in there that had been in prison for violence and murder and whatever that had gone down there. So I never, ever felt safe. I slept with a knife under my bed. I got one sharpened in the kitchen by a Brazilian guy and, yeah. Wow. I didn't feel safe. Were you safe from the guards? Were they generally, did they beat people? Were they brutal or not? The guards can be very, very brutal. Um, Generally, though, the prison is run by prisoners. The guards, like even prison, what people don't know is it's a city. It's not just like a one-block thing. It is a massive city that apparently holds 90,000 prisoners. So there is buildings and cell blocks everywhere, and the guards are at the bottom, and it's a high-rise with different floors. I was in Ward 8, which was the place where they have political prisoners and foreigners, and the guards are down the bottom and everywhere's locked and in your block, in your cell, there's a leader and he, it's run by prisoners. Wow. Okay. Um, so you get assessed. Where did you, that, so that's where you ended up. And, and what were your prospects of getting oh. out of what sounds like hell? At that stage, I didn't know, and and after subsequently after a time, they they gave me a bail. So the bail, the conditions of the bail was I had to pay two times the amount of the money that I was caught with, and I I was caught with about one hundred and fifty thousand New Zealand dollars, which was just an oversight of my behalf to do that. I was desperate to get out of the country So at the they time said, we will bail you if you give us $300,000. Correct. And, and I did not have $300,000 in Iran. I did in New Zealand from working hard my whole life. But yeah. so my business partners, their, his brother, who I owe greatly, put up his apartment block as collateral. We tried to put up our, our building that we had purchased and they wouldn't accept that. And they wouldn't accept anything except something that they could sell in a quick thing. And so he they put it up the as reddies. collateral. They were after reddies. Did it look like a, a, a judicial administrative process or were they just shaking you down, Rob? I just think they wanted money. It was, it's harsh, harsh punishment. They wanted money. My, my business partner said to me, I'm not going to release my apartment until I, myself, cover his apartment with money in case the bad happens and he loses it. So um, I had to get money from New Zealand, which my <clears throat> my ex-wife helped me at the time, sent money over. I can't tell you the process that we did, but it wasn't legal. We sent money against my prison account. And then after 46 days, I was released and sent back to my apartment in Tehran. Okay. What did you get any New Zealand consular or diplomatic assistance during this time? I did. Okay. It was limited. Because it was the, it was the public holiday over there, Nauru's, and everyone went back to New Zealand. So there was not one member of the New Zealand government at the residence there. I was on my own. Wow! But they sent letters from New Zealand. The they they were involved. Yes. All right. So you pay this what three hundred thousand dollars New Zealand, or or you get this guarantee. You get bailed out. I presume you were meant to be bailed and sit there and await trial or further investigation. You'd be a madman if you did. I take it you skedaddled. I did. The the process took one year. So after two weeks, I did not want to be in Iran. The bail conditions were so strict on me that I could not break the law in any, any instance. Like, so there was a lot of conditions on it and I decided... I wanted to come back to New Zealand, get a lawyer to fight my case for me. And so we we did a series of dummy runs to the airport because they didn't take my passport off me. That was the good thing. My business uh, partner got that. 
So I was able to go to, and my lawyer presented it to the to at the airport again, and they said they didn't say no, he can't leave. So I tried to leave the next night, and and the plane they wouldn't let me come back to my apartment. And so after about a two week process, they finally let me on the plane. And I tell you. If you've read anyone's stories in anyone's books about being stuck in an prison in Iran, that final moment of when waiting to leave the airport and you get on the plane and you're just saying, shut the doors, shut the doors and get off this ground, I want out of this country, is, is the most nerve-wracking part of it all. Wow. So how long home, after your arrest before the doors closed on the plane and it took off? Um, how long after my arrest? Arrest, yeah. So was, that whole saga from arrest to getting out of the country, okay. what was the time period for that? 46 days in the wow. prison and two weeks after that trying to get out. Okay. Um, and you came straight back to New Zealand? I did. Yeah. Came back to New Zealand in the lockdown. Oh, wow. So grateful. But having a bit of PTSD, tough times to get my head around. Yeah. But money taken away, and we were still fighting the process of the, the yeah. case for the next year, which had, had was a resolved a year ago. And okay, was and how was that resolved, um, Rob? I was convicted of currency smuggling and fined. Okay. So the whole process was just under half a million dollars. Convicted and fined. Did they take the $300,000 you paid for your bail? Did they give that back? No, oh, no, Nothing they didn't. Nothing was given back. Who do you Nothing think was he... given back. Nothing. Okay, so the currency, the 150000 that you were smuggling, 300000 you paid for your bail, that's four hundred. Yeah. that's half a million New Zealand dollars, and then the fine yeah. after your conviction. No, the, uh, t in total it was $450,000. $450,000. That experience cost me. It's an expensive yeah. holiday. That's an expensive way to see another country. Are you allowed back yeah. in Iran now? Not after doing this interview. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm standing. I'm going public with this. I've kept it from now. People have asked me to tell the story, and I haven't. I only because I, I I still have a business there. I want to go there. I have two business partners that I have to protect. Uh, when I speak out and say things, and I've been doing it because th you know this revolution is going on every day. Very hard to, to assess from here and from this far away. And I'm yeah. one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, Rob, and, and, and I was pretty critical of these two social media influencers who are, appear to have damaged New Zealand's ability to apply diplomatic pressure. But what is the word you are getting from your contacts in the country as to what is really happening there? Because it is easy for a regime like that to suppress the news and not let yeah. news of major change get out to the outside world. So I'm in contact every day with my friends uh, to understand the magnitude of it. They're fighting against a regime since 1979 with strict rules about women. Women cannot sing in public, cannot dance. There's no alcohol. Well, there's no legal alcohol in the country. There's so many rules, and they've said enough. When Masa Amini was killed in custody for showing a bit of hair, she was just, she's just one case of a lot of people that's happened to. And what's happening now is every day, young people are going out on the street. They're not going to their jobs and they're facing death every day. They're facing being shot, beaten, imprisoned. And they're saying enough is enough. We want the freedom. We want the right to choose when we can travel. We want to, to wear the clothes we want to wear. We, they just want freedom to live normally and, it's tough. Some of my friends are, friends have been imprisoned. Journalists are being imprisoned. Pe like sports stars, soccer well, stars. Well, I read anyone. somewhere their equivalent of Jamie Oliver, a 19-year-old chef, was beaten yes. to death at a protest. Um, yes. So uh, no one is immune. Killed. Yeah. I didn't know he was killed. I know he yeah. was taken in. Now, yeah. If you just on, on Instagram or, or say anything and you're a celebrity there, they'll come and get you. And you won't you won't appear again. Like in my cell, there were guys there that were political prisoners doing ten, had done ten years. There were three guys that were, that had converted from Islam to Christianity doing ten years just for that. It was harsh. So so, harsh. so it seems to me there are two Irans. 
and there's the Iran that you clearly love, which yes. was the landscape and the people, and if you like, the real culture. Um, yes. That sounds to me tolerant, perhaps more tolerant indeed than other uh, cultures in that part of the world. And then there is the regime, um, which for a long time, which replaced in itself a regime that was repressive, the Shah's regime, and then we have this religious fundamentalist regime. Do you honestly believe that what is going on now is ever going to get rid of the bad regime of whatever colour that runs Iran? And why do you feel that perhaps um, the Iranian spring and, and these protests are going to lead to real change? Because I hate to say, Rob, looking at it, the country has a pretty sad history of suppressing freedom and humanity. Yeah, it's it has to this time. That's why you're seeing people worldwide step up. That's why I'm finally speaking. That's why Coldplay the other night had a woman sing a song about freedom. That's why the world is standing up. This needs to happen. Iran, Iranians need to know that the world's with them and people all over the world are starting to broadcast this and saying, we're with you, Iran. You know, concerts, uh, Roger Waters standing up for Masa Amini, the protests. They've got no other choice. Yeah. If they don't do this and keep going, no matter how long it takes, and from what I'm getting from my friends every day is they're not stopping. It's getting more violent. It's it's going to the place where they're going to toss the mullahs out. And that guy, Harmony, he needs to go. All right. So you believe it will ultimately internally be a successful, well, revolution. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a revolution in Iran. Um, it's in can, progress. Right yeah. Now. Can it be successful without outside players? And does it, I'd almost say it needs to be successful without outside players because then you just have some foreign int interest coming in and creating a new regime. I mean, diplomatic pressure, what Jacinda Ardern is saying at the moment, standing up, all those help, but it's got to come from the inside. It's got to come from the people that are saying enough is enough. We mm. want our freedom. We're not going to let you take our family's prison just for showing a bit of hair. We're not going to let you kill us anymore. This is enough. Yeah. It has, and yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. Uh, well said. I guess the other problem that they might face is the world's empathy. Well, it's not a bottomless pit, and we're all very, very focused. Would seem to me on Ukraine, um, who are fighting an external. Uh, Invader, is there a comparison between the two situations? Not really. That's a war going on in Ukraine, Russia, and Iran. It's a, it's a different kind of battle. I mean, mm. Iran is very aggressive in its po its foreign involvement with supporting terrorists worldwide and whatever goes on. I don't know the ins and outs of it all, but mm. this. It's, this is a different thing here. It's just about people's freedoms, women's rights, the women's rights. Yeah, to be that's equal. A, hu a huge part of it. Um, Rob, are you hopeful, and you clearly are hopeful, and you have faith in the revolution as it unfolds? So you would hope to go back one day to a better Iran? Yes, I definitely want to go back. Yeah. For now, I can't until the regime falls, but yeah. I want to. Yeah. Rob, you yeah. haven't yeah. shared this story before. No. It's a remarkable story. Why did you keep it, 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 it quiet? Um, and was there any encouragement from anyone outside you, like our government or the Iranian government, to keep the story quiet? No, no. It was just basically myself. I was not ready. I was not ready to jeopardise my business partners. And... It was actually Owen Pomana, another Napier boy like me, who actually visited me in Iran years ago. He said, "Tell your story. It's the time. Mm. It's the time to do it." And, 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 and you might, but you might put your business partners at risk by talking to me today. Or do you correct. believe that now you're past the tipping point? It's all in. I'm, I'm past the tipping point. I want to see this keep going. There's an amazing silver lining to all this that I wanted to share before we finish up. And yeah. that is 
in the course of me being in the prison, I had a bit of a meltdown. It was so tough. Don't blame and you. The smoke bombers rejected me. They wouldn't eat with me. They were mostly Muslims. Um, I'm from a Christian country. They, you know, automatically assume they separated me. And there was one Nigerian guy who took me under his wing, and his name was Innocent. He gave me some clothes. He gave me cutlery. He gave me food, and he helped save my life. And after I was released and got back to New Zealand, he was he was doing he was he was um, given death the death penalty. He was, he had smuggled drugs in from yeah. from his background many years ago. Given the death penalty, finally it was thirty years, and then good behaviour fifteen years. And after he had served seven and a half years, they said, "Oh, you can go free, but here's your fine." And they slapped a fine on him that he could never pay. The fine was t around twenty thousand New Zealand dollars. I got back to New Zealand and I'm sitting in my house here in Napier with my car and my freedom, and I'm, he's ringing me every week from prison. He never asked me for a cent, but I I just couldn't. It didn't sit right with me, and I said to my two mates, "Let's just chip in." And we paid his twenty thousand dollars. We got the money smuggled in to Nigeria through Dubai into Iran, put it against his account, and it took one year. And thank God he got freed and he went back to his family and his three children. And we talk every week. He rings me from Nigeria. We contact. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing silver line, a good thing that came. If that was the whole reason I went to prison, just to get him back with his children, it was worth it. Rob, this has been um, one of the most uh, interesting half hours I've spent at work for a long time. I do thank you for, for, for sharing your story with us. Just... Two things I want to close off. What would you say to those two social media influencers who went to Iraq against official advice? And I don't know what deal they would have had to done to get out, but one can presume from, you know, if it's anything like your story, money changed hands. What would your message be to them about what they did? I guess they're, I guess they're going to want to finish their journey um, it was the same with the two Australian people, uh, mm. the way over land. They were put in, in the same prison, the same mm. cell as me, but three months before my imprisonment. And, uh, that, you know, they're going to want to continue their journey. And they've just got to be sensitive and pay attention when a country is on a danger list because of social unrest. You just don't go in there because you, you're jeopardising your life here. That's yeah. pretty much what it is. And yeah. I don't know their whole story. I don't know how they got out. They yeah. weren't arrested. They weren't in prison. I think they were under some house arrest. Yeah. And I guess money was involved. I don't know. It always seems to be in the end to get some kind of freedom. Mm. But And for anyone future wanting to go to Iran, it's not a good time now. Just wait for the regime to fall, and then your opportunity for tourism is going to be incredible. And, and you'll be sipping a, a good coffee as well if things go according to plan for you. Rob, again, Absolutely. thank you very, very much indeed for taking the time to share that You're amazing welcome. story with us today. And, and you know, I, I, I hope you get your dream and you get back to Iran to see your buddies there real soon, real soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That is Rob McGregor, Kiwi businessman, 40 days, 46 days in an Iranian prison, basically held to ransom, pay some money, and then, well, does what anyone would do, gets the hell out of Dodge and some really, really interesting insights into what is happening uh, in Iran.